time for another technique on how to solve some of these first order differential equations. Now, I want to say this before we get going on it, that sometimes more than one technique is possible to solve some of these differential equations. And we've, we've actually already seen that, but now this technique is going to come back and say, there's some problems that we did on it with Bernoulli equations or with homogeneous that this works really nicely on. And in the next video, I'm going to revisit five of those. And there are going to be five of the problems that were like, wow, that was really tough with homogeneous, or that was really tough with Bernoulli. And it's a piece of cake with this. So this technique called embedded derivatives, it's it's really cool. It's, a, it's thinking outside the box. It's not fitting these differential equations to a specific te technique, but it's looking for a piece in this differential equation that we can work with. And here's how it works. So when we talk about these embedded derivatives, or, or when we're looking for an embedded derivative, what we're looking for is in a differential equation, do you have a piece of it that is the derivative of another piece? Because if you do, well, maybe we can write, rewrite this dy dx with this function as dv dx by, by making a little substitution. So embedded derivatives, this technique still does a substitution, but it's looking for something very specific. It's saying, do you have a piece of your differential equation that is a derivative of another piece? Now here's what it has to have into it. So look for a piece that's a derivative of another piece. It has to include a y. So here's the idea. Here's what we're going to be going. This is how I want your brain structured so that when we get there, it makes sense to you. We're going to be picking a function of y that we're going to call v. All right. So function of y equals v. Take a derivative. We'll get a dv dx. We'll get a function of y that's a derivative, but then we'll get dy dx by the chain rule. Well, wait a minute. If you picked this function of y so that the derivative of that is also in your differential equation, then when we take a derivative, this should give us this piece over here with the dy dx by the chain rule. And that's going to clear, clean up a ton of this differential equation for us. It's a very cool technique. Now, does it work every time? Well, no, of course not, because we don't always have two functions of y. We don't always have a function of y that's a derivative, a direct derivative of another piece, or we can't make it into that. So it, we use it when we can, but it doesn't happen every single time. So I'm going to walk you through how it works, when we get to use it. Um, but if you do see it, man, use it, because it's going to save you a lot of time as far as manipulating your differential equation, try to fit like Bernoulli or homogeneous or something like that. So let's go ahead. So then we're, we'll replace our dy dx not with just uh, dy, sorry, replace not just dy dx, but an entire function dy dx. So one more time all the way to, through, we're looking for a piece that's a derivative of another piece of y. When we call the piece that's not the derivative, v, Okay, includes a y. Let's take a derivative. We'll replace not just dy dx, but an entire function with it. Let's check this out on this example. We'll do about four more after this. Um, this one's really kind of basic, just to get our feet wet, and then we'll get through it. So, uh, looking at the differential equation, and it is one. Um, man, it doesn't look linear. There, there's not even really an x up there. I don't want to start making this homogeneous. It's not a basic integration. It's not separable. It doesn't look like, uh, doesn't even look Bernoulli because I don't have y to the first power. So what in the world am I going to do? Let's look for an embedded derivative. Maybe that's one of the first techniques we even check out. Because here's what we're looking for. We're looking for a function that is the derivative of another function. That's what we're looking for. A piece of this differential equation that is a derivative of another piece. And it has to have y's in it. That looks pretty good. Now, here's how this is going to work. If we call this piece V the piece that you're not, sorry, the piece that's not the derivative. So let's let V equal Y to the third. Think about what is going to happen. The reason why this technique works is because if this piece is the derivative of this piece, then if I call this V and I take a derivative of this piece, well, what's going to happen? Well, not only am I going to get this whole thing back, because this is the derivative of that, but I'm also going to get dy dx by the chain rule. So let's take a derivative. On the left-hand side, we get dv dx. Great. On the right-hand side, we get 3y squared. No problem. But then dy dx. 
And this is the magic of this, this technique. It says, well, wait a minute. You mean to tell me you're going to wrap up all your whys all at once? Yeah, that's why, that's why it includes the why. So if you wrap up all your whys all at once in terms of the, this is really nice for us. So when we start replacing these things, we know that y cubed is going to be v. So this was v, no problem. We take a derivative. Obviously, the piece that's a derivative of it is going to show up. So 3y squared, hey, it shows up right there. But more than that, by the chain rule, we get this dy dx. We can replace this like in mass, this whole thing. This is great. So this entire piece of junk right here, we're going to replace with dv dx. So this entire piece, that whole piece, is now dvdx. Plus, do we have a y cubed anymore? No, that's what we're calling v. That's how we got this derivative in the first place. Do we need to worry about e to the negative x? Well, no, we don't, because that's got x's in it. And it's okay to have v's and x's. Remember the idea on a lot of these substitutions is wrap up the y's. Wrap up the y's so that they become v's and dv dx, and then we can integrate in a different, in a, uh, sorry, with a different dependent variable, this v, and then go back at the very end. And that's where this technique really shines. It says if you have a piece that's a derivative of another piece, and in fact it's this whole thing really, then you go, okay, let's call this piece v, the one that's not the derivative. That way when I take a derivative of it, the other piece shows up, and the other piece is called dv dx. So this whole piece gets dv dx. This piece is what we call v. This piece, we don't even care. And now hopefully this is going to change into something that we can use. Um, linear or separable or some other thing that we can make work. So for us, well, let's see. Uh, we're now in terms of v for our dependent variable. I see dv dx. I see v to the first power. I see a function, wait a minute, that's linear. I see a function of x. So what if we say, u of x is one. Can we find an integrating factor so that we can solve this, um, this linear differential equation in terms of v now? Yeah, we know rho of x is gonna be e to that Integral of p of x, that's e to the x. We don't need a plus c, we've talked about y. Let's multiply everything by that. So both sides, this entire equation by e to the x, that's going to give us e to the x dv dx. Plus e to the x v equals, well, if we multiply e to the negative x times e to the positive x, yeah, what's that going to give us? Well, that's the add exponents. It's going to give us zero. That's one. I'm going to move up here. So this side, do you remember how the this whole linear idea works? The whole linear differential equation idea works in you're using an integrating factor, and we can use integrating factors in different ways. This is just one way we use them. It, you were using an integrating factor to create this result of a product rule. So let's find the product. If this is the result of a product rule, the pieces here and here came from the original product. Well, now we know we can integrate both sides. So if we integrate both sides with respect to x, we're going to get e to the x times v equals integral of 1 dx. Oh, cool. All right, that means that e to the x times v equals x plus c. we got to have a c up there. We know that when we integrate, we get a plus c. We don't need one for an integrated factor because e to the c would be divided away right away since you're multiplying every term by it. Now, we do have to solve for v. Well, how would we do that? Um, use divide by e to the x or use e to the negative x. That would work. But now we realize one more thing. With all of these substitution techniques that we're making with v, we got to go back and get y eventually. So we're going to go back right here to the substitution we made just like before, just like homogeneous or any of those other ones. We use this twice. We use it one time to get away from the y's. We use it another time to get back to the y's. So let's go back to the y's. If v equals y cubed, 
then y cubed equals this x plus c e to the negative x. That's the embedded de derivative technique. Easy problem, yeah, and I'm show you some other ones that aren't as easy. But man, is it cool. I hope you're seeing the utility in this. I mean, this is really, this is really impressive. The fact that we have a piece that's a derivative of another piece, we just call the piece that is not the derivative part. So let's call it the parent function. Um, call that v. Then when you take a derivative of it, yes, you're going to get v dx. That's a substitution. But you're also going to get the other piece that is the derivative with the dy dx. We replace the entire thing with dv dx. Very neat. Gives us linear in this case. We can solve it down. Make sure you get back to y's. Um, hope that's making sense to you. Let's do a few more examples. All right, let's get ready for another two. So we have a differential equation. We're looking at it, and it, it looks very similar to the last example, but it doesn't look very similar to any of the techniques that we've used. And so we're looking at it going, I, I don't know what to do with that. Well, maybe we start looking outside the box. Instead of looking for a specific homogeneous substitution or an obvious substitution or a Bernoulli substitution, let's look for an, an embedded derivative. Can you see a piece of this? Ask yourself right now, can you see a piece of this where you see one part of your differential equation connected to a dy dx equal to another part of your differential equation that has y's in it? Remember, with all of these substitution techniques, we need to wrap up all of the y's with it. So it has to work with the y's. Um, if it doesn't, then this is not the right technique to use. So we're looking for a piece of the, the differential equation connected to a dy dx that's the derivative of another piece, and we're going to make that substitution. So that other piece, the one that's not connected to the dy dx, that's got to be your v. So when we're looking up here, we're going, well, uh, oh my gosh, hey, there's y cubed, that's great. Here's 3y squared dy dx. That right there is the derivative of y cubed. Now what about the x? Don't worry about that, that little guy. Don't worry about that little guy. Don't worry about the x. That's just going to be x times dv dx. Can we divide by that? Yes. Are we going to get a domain issue? Yes, and we'll have to define it when we get there. So when we're rewriting these things, we are going to get some domain issues. I'm going to start weaving that in right now. But when we're taking a look at our, our, our techniques, if one doesn't fit, you go, maybe I try a different technique. And one of them that we can sometimes rely on, just not all the time, but sometimes rely on, is this embedded derivative. So let's start working through it. We know this. And when I take a derivative of it, it gives us this. Let's call this piece v. Let's take a derivative on both sides with respect to x. I hope you've noticed this, but this is awful like doing a substitution with uh, with integrals. So like a u sub or something, when you look at it, you go, okay, I'm going to replace this part with a variable. I'm going to take a derivative. I'm going to replace this entire thing with the dx uh, all, all at once uh, with that substitution. That's exactly what we're doing here. So when we're looking at this going, hey, let's call this piece uh, y cubed. Let's take a derivative. Oh my gosh, it's just like the substitution technique in integrals. Cool, uh, 3y squared dy dx. Let's look for this piece in my differential equation. It's right, that's awkward, right here. So can I repl replace all of that stuff, 3y squared dy dx with dv dx? Yes, and that's how the embedded derivative technique works. It says, let's go ahead and replace all that. So I'm going to say 3y squared dy dx. All of this junk is dv dx. But what I didn't replace still needs to be there. I still need to have that x. On the right-hand side, I didn't do anything with the 3x to the fourth, but that y to the third power, that's v. So I'm going to replace that with a v. So again, we're looking at this. No technique looks apparent, but I'm going to try to think outside the box. Maybe a piece of this is a derivative of another piece. Call the piece that you want to take the derivative of v. Take the derivative of it you should get the other piece, dy dx. So a couple things to look out for. The derivative has to be connected to the dy dx by multiplication. I hope you understand why that is, because when you, when you replace it, you're replacing the derivative 
and the chain rule gives you a times dy dx. We need that to be the case. So when we're looking at it, you need the derivative piece to be multiplied by the dy dx somewhere. Other stuff can be around it, like that x factor, no problem. Just multiply that, or leave that when you multiply it by the dv dx. Well, let's look at what we got now. That's a differential equation. Hey, we got rid of all the y's. We wrapped up all the y's in b. We still have an x, that's fine. But this is dv dx instead of dy dx. Do you see a variable raised to the first power in the dependent variable? Yeah, I see v. That right there says this is going to be uh, a linear. So this is a linear differential equation now in terms of v and x. Let's write it as such. Let's subtract v. Hey, that's pretty cool. Now I've got almost a linear. What's the next thing that I would do? Well, to make a linear differential equation, I need to divide by x because I need the dv dx by itself. And so what it's going to give us is divide by x, divide by x, divide by x. We get dv dx, we get 1 over xv, we get, hey, 3x cubed. Now, I'm going to start working this in right now. You just divided by x, and now we should be pretty clear on, on that, we're, that we're going to have a domain issue. What is that domain issue? What can't x be? Well, x can't be 0. But because we're dealing with a linear, I'm going to bet that we're going to have an integrating factor that's going to have an ln of absolute value of x. To avoid that absolute value, I'm just going to make it greater than zero. We're going to put a restriction on our domain that way when we get there and we have our integrating factor of rho x and we go, oh yeah, it's not dealing with the absolute value. That's going to take care of it for us. So one more time all the way through. We're looking for a piece that's a derivative of another piece. Call it v. Take the derivative. It should be up there. Call the whole thing dv dx. Got it. Leave anything else that's not in that derivative. No problem. Then look at the form. Right now we have linear. Let's divide. Let's state this off to the side real quick. Just nice and neat. And now let's go ahead and find our integrating factor. Let's multiply. Let's solve this. So I know my p of x is negative 1 over x. So when I integrate, I have this e to the negative integral of 1 over x. No problem. That's a negative. Well, that gives us e to the negative ln x. Where's the absolute value? Right there. We, that's why we make those, those domain restrictions, so we don't have to deal with it later, because we found out in linear that a lot of times we can start simplifying our x's, but if one of them has an absolute value and one doesn't, that's an issue, and it causes some other domain issues to come up. So let's work with this one. This is going to be e to the ln 1 over x. Remember that we have a negative exponent. We can move that up. So x to the negative 1, sure. But that's going to be, let's see, composition of inverse functions, ln and e are gone. We get x to the negative 1 or 1 over x. Let's multiply that all three places. So we had dv dx minus 1 over x times v equals 3x cubed. And we're going to multiply both sides, so we're going to distribute by 1 over x and 1 over x and 1 over x. Let's simplify before we go any further. The reason why we do that is because we know with linear, we're trying to make this result of a product rule by using an integrating factor. But on the right-hand side, you're just going to be integrating that. And so we're going to definitely simplify here. But here we want to check our work. Remember that this, if this is the result of a product rule. The derivative of this piece must be this piece in terms of x. Let's just make sure that happens. So 1 over x, cool. dv dx, no problem. Negative 1 over x squared times v to the first. Is the derivative of 1 over x equal to negative 1 over x squared? Yes. Okay, now I, I, I know that that's going to be the result of the product. Here. Equals on the right-hand side, 3x squared. Since this was linear, since this is the result of a product rule, well, let's find the product. 
if this is the result of a product rule, it's leave the first alone times the derivative of the second, take the derivative of the first times the second. That had to be the product. Now we're good to go. We know that integrals undo derivatives. That's fantastic because we can just integrate both sides with respect to x. On the left-hand side, we just get 1 over x times v. On the right-hand side, we get x cubed plus c. <clears throat> and this is what we're, we're talking about is not really wanting an absolute value uh, up here with our integrating factor. Because if we had that, we'd have an absolute value here and here and here, but not 1 over here. And so we wouldn't be able to start multiplying by x and getting x to the fourth. We wouldn't be able to do that. And so that's a lot of times why we, why we do this. We say, let's just let x be greater than 0 to avoid the absolute value altogether. It makes our simplification possible. Let's just use our technique very well. Let's go ahead and do it. Solve for v. So that means that we're going to multiply everything by x. We can either get x times the quantity x cubed plus c or x to the fourth plus c times x. Now there's one more thing we've got to do. The only other thing that we, we really need here is that we've got to replace the v back in, uh, with these terms of y. So we're going to look back at our substitution. Oh, let's see. We use the substitution one time to get away from our y's and one time to get back to our y's. So v equals y to the third. Let's replace it. That's about it. Um, we can write it just like that. We could solve for y explicitly. Uh, take a cube root of both sides if you want to. Either way is fine. But I'm hoping that this is making sense as far as the, the technique is concerned. What we're looking for, we're looking for a piece that when you take a derivative of it, it's also in your function, in your differential equation, multiplied by dy dx. That, that is the derivative. We replace the whole function that's the derivative with dv dx, and the function you took the derivative of with v. It'll lead to linear or some other form, and then we go ahead and solve that and work back to get our y's at the end. Keep in mind we're going to be dealing with some domain problems, especially with linear, especially when you start dividing. Um, we're going to get this x greater than 0 quite a bit. Let's do the next one. Why don't you try right now as I'm erasing this, just think through, it's kind of a tough one, but think through, is there a piece up there in terms of y that when I take the derivative of it, it's there multiplied by dy dx in some fashion. Other things can be multiplied along with it, that's not a problem, but we need at least the piece I'm going to substitute to have a derivative that's up there multiplied by dy dx. Well, here's a piece of y multiplied by dy dx. Is there anything up here that when I take the derivative of it somewhere else, I get dy dx? Yes. Now, what about all this other junk? Don't worry about the other junk. Let's go ahead and replace that e to the y, this one, with v. All right, well, if we're going to do that, well, we need to do y dx. Hey, we need to do y dx. That's why this substitution has to have y in it. Like every other substitution we had, it had to have a y in it so that we get a dy dx, so that we can replace that guy with dy dx. So the whole thing works in that the piece that you're calling v needs a derivative with respect to x that gives me a dy dx. It's got to be multiplied because the derivative here must repeat give me this. It also has to be a dy dx to give me this. We replace the whole thing. Everything in your substitutions, you should have caught on by now, everything in your substitutions you need to get rid of all your y's. It needs to be in terms of v and x when you're done. So that's the way the embedded derivative works. It says call this piece of e. That way when I take a derivative of it, Not only am I going to get the other piece, the e to the y in this case, I'm also going to get dy dx. That's why these things have to be multiplied together. Your derivative has to be multiplied by dy dx because we're going to be taking a derivative of something with y, and it's going to be multiplied by dy dx. Let's go ahead and let's, let's change the whatever we can in this. Am I going to change the x? Well, no, that wasn't in the derivative. But this whole entire piece, e dy dx, that is now dv dx. 
on the right hand side, I still have a 2, but e to the y, that's now v, and I still have all this stuff. Did you guys see it? Do you see that this embedded derivative thing wraps up all the y's into something very nice? It says I'm wrapping up the piece that's not dy dx as v. That way when I take a derivative of it, it's giving me the piece that is a derivative dy dx. All of the y's are nicely wrapped up. Now we got to solve it. Um, well, you know what? I hope you're seeing it. Is it separable? Doesn't look like it. Is it linear? Yeah. You have v to the first power. That's the only instance of v. Let's distribute the two. Let's get the v in, on the same side as dv dx. Let's divide by x and see what happens. Maybe you can try it right now. Let's distribute. That looks a little bit better. It says, oh, hey, there's a v. There's no other v's. That's v to the first power. It's not Bernoulli. There's no other v's. Uh, can I subtract it to get my dv dx and my, my v to the first power uh, term on the same side? That's pretty close. There's one more thing we need to do to make it linear. Hopefully you're seeing it. Hopefully you see that we got to divide by x right now. So I'm hoping you see. I'm hoping you see that when you're modifying or changing or manipulating, however you want to say it, these differential equations by division you're going to get a domain problem. So I've said it in several videos now that this is going to be an issue for us. Let's define it right now. So we're dealing with linear. Put that in your head right now. We're, we're dealing with linear, and we know that x can't be 0, but we also know that we're going to be dealing with an integrating factor to solve this. So if x can't be 0, great. But do you want to deal with absolute values later with linear? No, because oftentimes we can simplify a lot of x's, and the absolute value would hold us back. Let's just make this greater than 0. That's going to show up. This is not because of this right now. It's not greater than zero because of this right now. It's greater than zero because of the integrating factor later so that we don't have to have the absolute value. So keep that in mind. Um, how about we go ahead and find that our p of x. If this is linear, it's got to have a p of x. Let's find our integrating factor rho of x, which we know what that is. That takes e to the integral of p of x. Which gives us e to the negative 2 ln x. Hey, that's pretty cool because we don't have to have this whole absolute value. We can simplify very nicely and get 1 over x squared. Let's see what how that happens. So we'll move up this negative 2 We know composition of inverse function simplifies e with ln. We have rho of x equals 1 over x squared. Let's multiply by that. So that's our integrating factor. We're going to use that to solve our linear differential equation in terms of v and x. We know that we're creating this result of a product rule. And that's what that missing piece, integrating factor, does for us in this case. So we had, let's see, we had dv dx. minus 2 over x times v equals, let's see, 2x squared e to the 2x. And we're going to take that row of x and multiply it every single term. Because we're multiplying both sides, it's going to distribute. So 1 over x squared and 1 over x squared and again. Let's make sure we simplify at least the right-hand side. If you want to trust your math and just understand that your product from this would be 1 over x squared times v, I guess that's fine. I'm going to simplify one more step because I want to check the work. So 1 over x squared dv dx, that's good, minus 2 over 
x cubed v. I'm going to pause right here. I'm just going to make sure. Is the derivative of this, this, let's see, that would be x to the negative 2. I'd bring down the negative 2. Negative 2. Subtract 1, that's negative 3, move it back down. Yes. Now I know that I have the right integrating factor. I know that really the result of the product rule now. On the right hand side, x squared are gone. And now we're ready to do two things. Number one, we're ready to write this as the, pro the product that when we take a derivative with respect to x, it gives us back that result. And then we're ready to say, hey, if I take an integral on both sides, On the left-hand side, we just get 1 over x squared times v. On the right-hand side, let's see, uh, that's a small, a minor u sub. So u would be 2x. The derivative would be 2dx. I'd have to divide by 2. So I'm going to get e to the 2x, but the 2 and the dividing by 2 are gone. So this 2 gets divided out when you have that substitution of du over 2. All right, well, um, maybe we can solve for v right now. So if we multiply both sides by x squared, I guess I better do it right. We have our plus c, we have e to the 2x plus c, multiply both sides by x squared, and there's one more thing we've got to do. We use our substitution to get away from y's and into v's. Now we use it again to get out of v's and back into y. So let's look back for it. Uh, it says e to the y. All right. So if v is e to the y, then we have, maybe I'll rewrite this a little bit, x squared e to the 2x plus c. If you wanted to solve this for y, we do ln on both sides. So if e to the y equals x squared e to the 2x plus c, then y equals ln of x squared e to the 2y, the 2x plus c. Yeah, that's about as good as we can make it. Are you seeing it? Are you getting the point? The point of these embedded derivatives is that if one piece is there, I take the derivative and it's multiplied by the dy dx, I can substitute out both of them. They become v's and it's, it's kind of cool. Um, it saves us a lot of work. If you try to make this into other techniques, either it's impossible or those other techniques are really difficult. I'm going to show you that in the next video. We're going to do five examples just like this of, of some problems we did in Homogeneous and, and, um, and Bernoulli that, man, this makes them a lot nicer. So I just want to show that to you in a separate video. We have two more examples now to get our, our, our basis just perfect, and then, uh, then we'll move on and do a different video. All right, last two. This one I'm going to do all the way with you. Maybe you can start it right now. I'm going to do all the way with you. This one I'm not going to. I'm going to show you how to set up because it's a little weird. And then I'm going to leave you when we get to the, the type of differential equation that you can solve on your own. So let's start with this one. Look at it. Can you see a piece that when you take a derivative of it is up there and has dy dx next to it? If you can, write out v equals that piece right now. So v equals that sine squared y. Why that one? Because when we take the derivative of sine squared y, we get, let's see, bring down the exponent, that'd be 2, leave the inside alone, sine y to the first power, but derivative of the inside would be cosine y. That's the chain rule again. So the derivative of sine squared y is 2 sine y cosine y. Just to hit it again, you, you have to have all of your y's wrapped up in whatever substitution you are making. So if this is going to be your v, the derivative of that better include a dy dx. Got a y in it. 
It's got to include everything else that has a Y that's connected to it. So it's got to do that. And it does. This says, all right, well, hey, here's two sine Y, cosine Y. Here's two sine Y, cosine Y, dy dx. It's going to replace all of that stuff except for the X. So all of that is dv dx except the X equals. Now, for, we're not worried about the Xs. 4X squared is fine. But we have this sine squared y as v. Man, it looks a lot nicer. Here, this looks like junk, but this looks a little less like junk. It looks like linear to me. Can we subtract the v? Can we get the v to the first power on the same side as dv dx? Let's do that. Can we make it into the linear differential equation? Can we divide everything by x? So dividing by x, we get our dv dx, we get our minus 1 over x v, we get equals 4x because we divided by x, wait a minute, we divided by x. We divided by x on a linear. Can't be 0, want it greater than 0 for the absolute value, so let's not have to write that. That's why we put that, happens on linear a lot. Let's see if we get the rest of it. So it's linear, we know what p of x is, p of x has to be this negative 1 over x. We know rho of x then will be e to the e to the integral of p of x. All right. Rho of x would be e to the negative ln x. We don't worry about absolute value. We, we restricted our domain to x greater than 0. But we do know that rho of x could be written as e to the ln x to the negative 1. Hey, composition of inverse functions, x to the negative 1 is 1 over x. Are you with me? Are you getting it? Is it making sense to you where we're getting this stuff? It's just linear, I know. But doing the embedded derivative substitution lets us see that really well. Hmm. Now let's use it. So we know that we'll be multiplying every single term by 1 over x. So dv dx minus 1 over x times v equals 4x, and we'll multiply by the integrating factor, by distribution, on every single one of those terms. Let's simplify it, let's check our work, and then let's integrate. So 1 over x dv dx looks really good. This gives us minus 1 over x squared. Let's double check. Is the derivative of this equal to this? Yep equals just 4. Linear works by making the result of a product rule. We now know what the product is. That product has to be 1 over x times v. And when I take the derivative with respect to x, it gives me this. Therefore, the, the undoing of that says, hey, this is the result of a derivative with respect to x of some sort of product that is right in the product. On the right-hand side, we get 4, and we know how linear differential equations are solved at this point by using that integrating factor. We take an integral on both sides with respect to x. Left-hand side, done. Man, I love that technique. Right-hand side, 4x plus c. Hmm. Uh, well, because we don't have the absolute value here, we're able to multiply by x and start doing things like getting 4x squared. We wouldn't be able to do that if we had the absolute value. That's one reason why we get rid of it, why we restrict our domain with that condition. It's important for us to know. So v would equal 4x squared plus cx. What else we got? Oh yeah, we got to get back to y's. So if v equals sine squared y, then sine squared y equals that. Man, I'm not sure if I would even go any further than that. Uh, we'd start taking square roots with plus and minus. That'd be it. Well, we wouldn't have the minus, would we? Um, let's leave it. 
leave it just leave it implicit it's it's crazy to try to solve that any further than, than that i hope it's making sense i hope it's making sense on why we're using this technique and most importantly how it's working so how it's working is great remember we have some domain restrictions when we're going through this especially when we get to linear and homogeneous now if you're wondering well all of these ended up being linear, all, all the last four. Are they always going to do that? The answer is no. That's why I'm going to start this problem with you. I'm going to show you that they don't always end linear. It's okay to not get linear differential equations out of doing this embedded derivative substitution that we're doing. So let's check out this last one. x plus e to the y dy dx equals x e to the negative y minus 1. And you're looking at it and you're going, hey, that doesn't look like anything I know. It's definitely not linear. Um, it's not separable. Uh, it's not a basic integral. It doesn't look Bernoulli. It doesn't look homogeneous. I can't even make it homogeneous because I got to e to the y. What in the world am I going to do? That's a good indication, especially the e to the y there with no other y's, that you're going to have an embedded derivative. And so let's look for it. But you look for it and you go, wait a minute. The derivative of this piece is not this, and furthermore, that's not multiplied by dy dx. Think of order operations. It's added first. That's a problem. So how do we fix that problem? One way to start fixing this problem is to multiply by, by something that's going to simplify and give you a derivative. So for instance, I want the derivative of some sort of like e to the y to be connected to this. So let's multiply by something that does that. And that's nasty. Let's get rid of it. Well, wait a minute. What if I multiply both sides by e to the positive y? We're obviously not multiplying by 0 or anything because e to the y can't be 0. It's always positive, so that's fine. Um, maybe if I rewrite this... and write the e to the y second dy dx and take a close look at what's going on, on the right hand side. So the reason why we thought of this was the I, it's not fitting any model. It looks close to having a derivative over here, but it's not really working because that needs to be positive and I need this piece right here and not connected with addition. Let's multiply to make that happen. When I multiply by e to the y, I'm going to get rid of that. So x e to the negative y times e to the y gives me x e to the negative y plus y is 0. That's just x minus e to the y. And there it is. And then we go, oh, cool. If I take the, excuse me, the derivative of this piece, I get e to the y dy dx. Now you can go ahead and try it. Why don't you try it on your own as I'm going through it? Go ahead and call the piece that's not next to dy dx, but has all the other y's in it. Call that piece v. Take the derivative of that piece. And, you know, you might have to guess and check a little bit on some of these ones if it's not apparent. I had to think about that for a while before I said, oh yeah, if I multiply by e to the y, I'm going to get rid of this, I'm going to get an e to the y, and the derivative would be here next to dy dx. So now I have to think about that. So the derivative of e to the y is e to the y, but it's a chain rule with respect to x, so e to the y dy dx. Let's start replacing stuff. Now we see that this whole piece is dv dx. x is x, no problem, e to the y is v, that's no problem. But do you remember me telling you, this was like 10 minutes ago, I said it like 13 times, that all of your y's have to be replaced with v's. What that means is that you can't leave that guy. So all of this is dv dx, yes, and that's x, and that's v. But if e to the y is v, then that e to the y also is v. And that saves you a headache because otherwise you'd have three variables. Not okay. And now we look at it and think, well, I actually don't have just v to the first power. I have a v here, and if I were to distribute, it would be multiplied by dv dx. I'd have to divide. I don't want to be doing that. I want to get v to the first power. What could I do in this case? Well, wait a minute. I had another section. We had, uh, 
we had homogeneous equations and it looked a lot like this. In fact, if I start dividing, if I start dividing by that, uh, well, it's not linear, but if I divide everything by x, And I say, you know what? x can't equal 0. Make sure we know that. We're dividing by x. You obviously cannot let x equal 0. <clears throat> OK, so if that's the case, can we make a substitution that's homogeneous? The answer is yeah. And hopefully you can do that on your own for, for the rest of the way. We'd make a, I don't want to, but we'd make a, another variable, say we we've used up our v's, so call it w, w equals y over x, I'm sorry, v over x, I'm so used to doing that, w equals v over x, do the exact same thing we did for homogeneous and you can solve it. So that's just a, 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 one quick example to show you that not all of these things when we do embedded derivatives work out to be linear, it certainly is nice when it is, uh, but we can do things like other techniques like homogeneous or some basic integrals that, that we have, so watch out for that. I hope it's made sense to you. I hope you see the, the kind of power in this technique. The technique works this way one last time through. The technique works that if it's not fitting something that's apparent, or even if it is, and this way is easier, if you see a piece term that has y's in it, that when you take a derivative of it, it gives you the other y's multiplied by dy dx. And you can replace all of your y's and dy dx in terms of v by taking that substitution. That's an embedded derivative. And they'll work out to something that you can use, hopefully linear or homogeneous or another technique that I've taught you. But that's pretty cool. So we're looking for a piece, some term, that when I take a derivative of it, it's multiplied by dy dx, call this piece v, then you get the derivative and dy dx, replace everything all at once. That's nice. So hope it makes sense. On the next video, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you five examples that we've done other ways. I'm going to show you that this way could have really shortened them. Um, so check that out. Stick with it for the next video. It's kind of, it's a good, it'll be a good one. So I'll see you for that.